So we have with us a Mount A student, and we were the planning committee was just so excited that we would have a student willing to present. So I'm really I checked yours off right away. Um, the title is Title Papers Oh Please. So um, Keisha, is that how you pronounce your yes. name? Garden. Yes. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. Is with us today from Mount Allison University, and. Um, Sorry about the delay. I'm not sure what happened to Roxanne, who was supposed to be here to introduce. No worries. <clears throat> okay. So, as she said, I'm a student at Mount Allison. I'm fourth year psych. And when I was told about the conference and I was asked to put some ideas out about, you know, what do I think should be a focus for universal design? And I looked at Anne, who is the coordinator at the Mian Center at Mount Allison University, and I said, well, what about the students? She goes, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, what do the students think? She just looked at me and she goes, that's a great idea. You should talk about that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, hello. Hi. I'm sorry. Oh, but thank you. <laughs> no worries. Um, so what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be taking a quick look at the traditional education model and criticizing some of the things that students found with that to not be applicable in the university setting. And then I talked to some students and some faculty at Mount Allison and I got their opinions about what worked, what didn't, suggestions for the future. And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to my topic, papers. Oh, please. Not another one. <laughs> So the traditional teaching model, we all know about this, we've used it in the past, and it focuses on rote learning, memorization, and you know, the focus behind that is that practice makes perfect. This is great for primary school education where you're learning the alphabet, but it doesn't really apply to the university setting. Once we hit university, our faculty have told me that they're looking for students to take an idea, tear it apart, rip it from inside out and apply it to different scenarios, situations, and look at it in a completely different way. Take that idea and make it their own. And the traditional teaching model doesn't really encourage that as much. So we all know what that looks like. We've seen it in movies, we've seen it in the classroom, and it's a lecture hall. We cram the students in there and they sit in their seats with their little desks and they type on their laptops and there's a professor at the front of the room and they're instructing and the students are listening. They have multiple AV screens on there so that everybody can see what's going on. The room is so large that they need speaker systems in order to be heard. But there are problems with this. The classroom design itself doesn't encourage discussion because if this, the, the instructor needs to have a microphone to be heard, what if a student has a question? Chances are they're not gonna be heard, so why raise your hand? And there are so many other things that cause some problems. The students are distance from the professor, so there's no interaction, right? They sit, they listen, they scribble down notes, and then they leave. The room is hot. That many bodies, that many electronics, people get tired very quickly. And it's interesting because in one of the seminars I'm taking this term, we discussed how people exume, or exert energy in a classroom. And it's exhausting to sit in this kind of space and sit still for that long. And the instructor doesn't necessarily realize that because they get to move around, right? They're standing at the front of the room, they get to point out different ideas, but the students are sitting in one small cramped space for a minimum of an hour at a time. And often when that lecture is over, they have about 10 minutes to move on to the next lecture hall and do it all over again for up to three to four hours a day. I've never been so tired in my entire life until I became a university student. I never napped until I became a university student. And it struck me as odd because it didn't seem like I was doing a whole lot. Why am I so tired? Well, Baumeister and Turney have a trade book that we were examining and it's called Willpower. And they were looking at the way people use energy to focus and maintain a self-discipline. They call it self-regulation. And it's limited. We use glucose in our body to energize our muscles, right? We also use it to energize our brain. And if we run low on energy, we burn out. So this kind of lecture style is just exhausting and it doesn't work. The students hate it. And I can't emphasize that enough. They hate feeling detached from their education. 
So then I asked the students, well, what do you think? And at first I met some resistance because like in the lecture hall, we're distanced from our profs in a way that we are not the experts, right? We're the ones receiving the education. We don't have the experience to say what they're doing is wrong and that they should be doing something different. So there's a hesitancy from the students to criticize what the professors are doing in the classroom. And that's how things don't change. So with some probing and some food, I managed to get a discussion going. And I got some really good information from these people. And I found that the answers that they had given me fell into a couple of areas. So the question I asked them was, if you could ask your professor to change one thing, and it didn't matter what they taught or who they were, because there's always that stigma about them being a PhD, what would you ask them to change, and why did you want it to change? So the first category that the answers fell into regarded assessment. And when I say assessment, I don't mean that we're afraid of it. Because we're not. We understand it's a necessary process to prove that we have accomplished something and that we've taken these ideas and we've learned from them. What I mean by assessment is that if we ask questions about what's on a test or further clarification for an assignment, we get some resistance. There's secrecy surrounding these tests. Tests shouldn't be so dominating over our minds that we get so stressed that we can't study properly. So some of the students had said they really like to have outlines, some sort of narrowed focus of what they can use to study for a test. Now, they're not looking for a blueprint. They don't want the answers, but just a guideline. Because what we think is important may not be the same thing as what maybe you think is important. So knowing where we need to focus our attention is really helpful because we have limited time in order to apply all of our knowledge in the test situation that we want to maximize that. And another thing that they had said is that sometimes their profs don't want to do a review in the class. But that's OK. Maybe instead of doing a review in class, provide a weekly thought-provoking question on your learning management system, like Moodle or Blackboard. You can have those answers submitted right to your email box. And then you get live feedback from the students when you introduce a new topic or a new concept. And you get to gauge where they are with the material. Do you need to go back and revisit something because 35% of the students didn't quite reach the goal that you were hoping they would achieve? Or can you move on to something else? It allows you to adjust the pace of your course to the students' needs. Because the students want to learn. Nobody wants to do poorly. We don't come to university to fail. But if we don't get the opportunity to constantly check how we're doing, we don't know how well we need to prepare for these assessments. Another suggestion that I had gotten from a student was perhaps limiting how much material goes on a test. So if you have a test on Friday, don't include new material right up until the class beforehand. Because 24 to 48 hours is not enough time for us to ask questions or deeply look at the material. It promotes rote learning. We have to memorize the information, not internalize it. And that's not always helpful. Because if you ask a question in a way that's different than in the classroom, we can't piece that together as easily because we didn't have the opportunity to examine this material from multiple angles. And that brought me to another example. If you take a course from a prof for the very first time, it's kind of like getting ready to jump into the swimming pool, right? You want to test the water first. You want to know and gauge what's going on. So if you were to post or send out by email a question to a student, it gives them an opportunity to gauge the way that you present material to them, to learn your writing style, to learn the language that you use, and questions can then come up when they need to. If you're used to using terminology in your field because it's natural, the student may not understand what those terms mean. And if they don't know prior to a test that you're going to use this language, at the test themselves, they're going to panic because they don't understand this term. And they don't know if it's because they didn't study well enough or because they're not used to the way that you use your writing style. And the last one that I got, which was really interesting, is that they would love it if a prof is unable to convey an idea in a way that all students can understand. Why don't they use other resources that are available to them? There are thousands of tutorials on the internet from other people who display information in different ways, visually, audibly, and it's a great tool. 
but people are afraid to give this information to the students because they're worried it'll discourage them from coming to class. But that's not the case. If you give an, an instructional video from someone else explaining a theory in mathematics that maybe you couldn't get the idea across to your students, maybe this other tutorial will do that for them. Or it might examine the idea in a different way that maybe they hadn't considered. But it's still a tool that they can use to learn. Something that all students would absolutely love is to get their tests back. And the reason for that is, is when we get our marks, it's an indicator of how well we've performed. We know that there are deficits in our learning, but unless we get to see those answers and see those comments, we don't know where the gaps in our knowledge is. So how can we use it to learn from our mistakes? If we don't have those materials available to use as study aids, to focus on areas where we don't necessarily have the best knowledge, we're not going to do any better on the next test, even if you revisit the material. Because we might restudy the same material thinking, this is where our problem is, not realizing that it's somewhere else. The next thing that students brought to my attention is that when you provide a test to the students, don't make it significantly harder than other assignments and projects that they are allowed to invest more time in. There's nothing more frustrating than when they go and sit down at a test and see that the depth of the material requires a great deal more time than they can put into it in that time to properly convey their idea. So I have a little meme for you. <laughs> and this has happened, right? I've had students tell me when I was sitting down and talking with them that they've gone to a test, they felt adequately prepared, but there was one question that required so much dedicated time to answer correctly that they couldn't get it all done, or they ended up wasting time because they had to go back later and finish the question. But instead, how about giving us assignments that have the real challenge, right? Because then we can ask questions, we can dig deeper, and we can really show our knowledge in other ways. The test has a limited time frame, so that should be where we show learning in other ways, but not in ways that we can't perform. So the second category that I had that students had discussed with me was flexibility. And flexibility is important because like all of the staff and faculty at the universities, <coughs> students have very busy schedules as well. We also have limited time and resources that we can dedicate to do well. We want to dedicate every waking minute of every day so that we can get that A in your class, but that may not always be possible. So for an example, I'm going to post a student's schedule, my own schedule, just to give you an idea of how quickly our time is eaten up every week. So I did regular Monday to Friday work week. And all of our classes at Mount Allison start at 8.30 in the morning, but the work day traditionally ends around 4.30 in the afternoon. So as a psych major, there are certain courses that I have to take in order to complete my major. One of those includes a seminar and a regular lecture. So I'm going to throw those in there. I also have to consider the courses that I need to take in order to complete my minor, which are three additional lectures. So let's throw those in there. But like most students, I also have a student loan. But that student loan doesn't quite cover all of the expenses that I need to look after when I'm a student, just my basic needs. So I also have a part-time job. So as you can see, my weekdays fill up very quickly. I have one afternoon on Friday, evenings and weekends, to do all of my readings, all of my assignments, and all of my studying. But this doesn't include laundry, grocery shopping, sleeping, or maintaining my interpersonal relationships with my friends and family, which are all other important aspects of our lives that we need to consider. So being flexible is incredibly important to a student. And one way that you can do that is by providing all of your assignment information and outlines the very first day of class. That puts the onus on us. We know when we have time. And there may be gaps during the term where we can apply more time than maybe a week before the assignment is due. And if we only get those outlines one to two weeks before the assignment is due, that might be too late for us to adequately dedicate time to the assignment to make it worth our while and actually reflect on how we can provide the best information to show our learning. Sometimes, though, we have to ask for extensions. And this is really difficult for us because, again, there's this distance between a lot of the professors and their students. 
It may be unintentional, but sometimes it's just there. But if a student comes to you and asks for an extension, they really need it. They don't like to wait to the last minute, and often they'll go in advance. But they're met with some hesitancy and a lot of really you know, provoking questions about why they deserve to have this extension. And I've had this happen to me myself. I went to a prof early in September and I said, look, I have three tests due two days before and one on the same day that I have to do this big assignment and you haven't posted the outline yet. Can I get the outline early and is it possible that I can hand it in like two days later so that I can adequately dedicate enough time to everything? Oh, sure, no problem, no problem, no problem. Well, the assignment outline didn't go up any earlier. And when I went to hand in the assignment late, I was brought to the front of the class at the end of the lecture and I was questioned about why I might have deserved having an extension. This is after a conversation where he had already had agreed to terms and we had talked about it multiple times. And it was really frustrating because it discourages us to coming to you for help. And that shouldn't exist. We should be able to come to you for help. That relationship shouldn't feel so foreign, right? And so one student suggested that instead of getting that resistance when we ask for extensions, what if at the beginning of the term you gave every student a couple of days of free passes? That opens up conversation from the students to the instructors about the possibility of being flexible with due dates. They have a limited number that they're allowed to use, but they can distribute them where they need to during the term, which gives them a sense of relief knowing that if something happens last minute and they can't get something done when they absolutely have to, that they can approach you and say, can I have an extra day? And they know that you're already open to the idea. Just knowing that takes a lot of the stress off of our shoulders. One other thing that's really interesting is when a student comes to a professor with a creative idea, a slight alternative to an assignment description, and we're told to stick to the outline. It's very frustrating because if we have this idea that requires just as much work and effort and will convey our knowledge in much the same way, why aren't we allowed to pursue that? It still requires research, and it still requires us to show that we understand the concept at hand. Well, I was lucky enough that I have an example of one such project. This is a pamphlet that discusses intersexuality for infants that are born in a hospital setting and the kinds of research that express how these children are treated, whether or not they undergo surgical procedures or they're allowed to stay as intersex children, psychological implications, and how the parents can go to support groups and deal with this when they're not expecting it. This required a great deal of research, and it's concisely put into a pamphlet form so only the most important information is available to the reader. In addition to this, there was a few pages where they discussed it in more detail and provided all of the references for their work. I did this for one of my classes, and it took me two and a half weeks to put together. And that doesn't include the research time. That is just going through the material picking out the key concepts, and finding a concise way to apply it in this setting. Why aren't we allowed to do this more often? If we are allowed to take our ideas and apply them in a way that plays to our strengths, you're going to engage us far more than just telling, do a lab report. Write a two-page paper, maximum 2,500 words. There's so many other ways that we can convey our knowledge, and it's really refreshing when we're allowed to do that because then we examine it maybe in a different way. Or we find that we have a passion for the project itself because we get to try something different, right? And that's always a lot of fun. So after talking about flexibility, I asked the students, what is another thing that you wanna talk about? And they said input was the next big thing on their list. They want input from you and they wanna put input into the course itself. Students said that they would really love it if they could help customize and design the syllabi for their class. Have alternative forms of assessment. Instead of doing tests, what about quizzes on Moodle that allows them to display mastery of a topic? Make it worth maybe three or four percent as bonus points, but they are only allowed to move on from one quiz to the next 
by achieving a grade of 85% or higher. They have to master the topic before they can move on. And it allows them to reflect, again, on the material that they may not know, go back, do more research, and evaluate it carefully before they continue. What about playing to our strengths? Like that one example that I had shed, shown about creative projects. If we know we're a better test taker, why aren't we allowed to weigh those slightly differently than a term paper? If term papers make us anxious, shouldn't they be worth a little bit less if we know we can do a project or speak in front of a group and provide a presentation? Play to our strengths and you'll get better performance, right? So students really liked it when professors had given them options between different types of assignments and ranges that they could apply certain percentages to. So they could weigh a test as little as 15% of their overall grade, but weigh a presentation as high as 40%, knowing that they would perform better in that environment over the test. They still have to put all the work into it. They still have to study. They still have to take the test and do the presentation. But a presentation instead of a paper might be less anxiety provoking, and you might get better work out of it. <clears throat> I'm getting ahead of my notes here. <laughs> um, another student had another idea. She was really enthusiastic about something called the flipped classroom. How many people know what a flipped classroom is? Awesome, so I don't even have to explain it. But there's benefit to that because that allows us to engage more time with discussion, right? If we already have seen the lecture notes, we already know your points and the key points that we need to look at in further reflection, then we can bring that to the class and we can bring it up in discussion and we can expand on those ideas a lot more. And because if we're allowed to discuss, that allows us to provide feedback. And also, it might make you realize that there's something really unique about the way we're approaching an idea that you maybe hadn't considered. Some of the faculty that I had spoken to had mentioned that they felt a renewed sense of love for certain topics because some of the ideas their students had brought up in the classroom were really unique and inspiring. It took a new spin on the way that they had started looking at this topic, something different than in the past. So after I talked to the students, I decided I was also going to talk to some of the faculty. And I had limited time to do this, so I didn't get to interview all of the faculty at the <coughs> university. But some of the responses that I got were amazing. I sat down, I popped a video camera out, and we had tea at the Cackling Goose, a little cafe in Sackville in the middle of July. Or we sat down in a cozy office, and we just you know, talked out different things. And it was great, because a lot of the faculty had different insights that I hadn't even considered. And some of those were you know, about the increased workload, whether or not that existed why they implemented universal design in the first place, and whether or not it had been worth it in the end. Those are all really good points to consider. So when I asked them why they brought it up in the first place, I had different responses. One professor had told me that one student had come to their class, they were struggling with a concept or an idea, and they really needed help. And so they started dominating their office hours. And they couldn't understand why this one student just wasn't getting it. And then, after further probing, they discovered that this one student was an advocate for many. The others just weren't comfortable coming to her to talk to her about these issues. And when that one student did that, it made the faculty member realize that one person in a classroom of many had unique skills and unique ways of evaluating and examining these ideas. There was no average student. We're all unique. We're all individuals. We should really be looked at in that way. Another professor had looked at it because he had been doing it for years. He was an administrator at the school, and he was VP of academics, and he married an occupational therapist, and it had been part of his life for a long time. And it was natural for him to put it into the classroom. And he's a huge advocate for block learning. He would love to see more universities have intensive learning blocks instead of five courses spread over 13 weeks. His idea was that we take 18 days and we dedicate those 18 days and get up over 40 class hours on one topic. 
and we master that topic. And then after those 18 days, we have a few days for a break, and we move on to the next one. The terms aren't any longer. We get more classroom hours and more dedication to a topic, and students performed better. And he hated the fact that it just didn't exist on a large scale, and he wants to see that change. And the last faculty member that I thought had a really interesting take on this is that he noticed that there were students in his classroom that were asking for accommodations and asking for adjustments in the syllabi, alternatives to assignments and tests, because they had either a disability or some need that required them to do that. But he saw other students who had those same needs, but no one to advocate for them. No recourse for getting these accommodations because they didn't have an official label to put on it. Labels are awful. And, you know, he wondered whether or not there was a way that he could allow all of the students to be accommodated in one way or another. So he decided that he was going to reevaluate and reexamine the way he conducted himself in the classroom. His perfect solution was to get rid of lectures altogether. Lectures don't promote learning in the same way as practical learning can do. Mind you, he's also in you know, biochemistry, so you know, lab work is a little bigger involved in that component. But he would love to see practical learning take over from the lecture format. The next point they brought up was that initially they found there was increased workloads when they had to reorganize and they had to adjust and change the way they were going to approach their topics. But once they had gotten that out of the way, the workload leveled off and it kind of did the same thing that it had always done. You had your increased workloads when you had to mark tests or papers or prepare the syllabus for that term, final exam preparations, but the rest of it was fairly steady because once they got the initial work out of the way, they could revisit it, tweak it, and adjust it as they moved on. Afterward, with <clears throat> The course materials, blah, 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 oh, sorry. Um, and all the faculty, faculty members that I had interviewed expressed a gratitude for impl implementing universal design in their classrooms. They found that the quality of work and the engagement of the students in the classroom when they made little changes here and there was phenomenal. I had one professor say that he had a student who was doing really poorly in his class. But when he gave her the option to take a different approach to an assignment, she produced a beautiful piece of work. She was a fine arts student, and she didn't want to write a poem for her final assignment. And it was a poem based on a specific style, and you had to reflect and do research on the way that it had been written in that time based on a particular author you had chosen. So instead, she had taken this work, and she mimicked the way that it was presented by William Blake. She did etchings and watercolor and she made these beautiful prints, multiple prints, with a song that she had written about a unique piece of experience in her life. And he was astounded at the work and the effort that she had put into it because she was still required to do the write-up. But rather than just write a poem, she took it in a whole different direction and she produced a different kind of work that was just as good. All in all, the faculty members were very happy with the way that they had done this and the way that it had turned out. And as a bonus for you guys, I'm actually working on the filmed interviews that I had conducted at Mount Allison, and I'm posting them on YouTube. I'm going to give the links to Jody once I get it all finished. That way you guys can all revisit this at your leisure and examine it from other perspectives. Thank you very much. Anybody have any questions for anything like that? Okay. Oh. I just wanted to say you're an amazing speaker. Oh, yeah. thank you. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, yeah, I just was uh, looking for some insight, I guess. Uh, sure. So for the last two years, for <clears throat> assignments where I've done faculty work for students and colleagues. So typically, for anything that would Right. PowerPoint, and then the last one is anything else that you can come up with, an interpretive dance, a poem, whatever, that demonstrates your methodology. Um, two years I've been doing this, nobody's ever done anything but a paper. <laughs> um, really? 
Really? Some of them are quite horrible, and I'm sure you can always help me out. Um, and I constantly, you know, attack the spy communities. I try to build confidence and say, please feel welcome. It's in the syllabus. You know, please feel welcome to do something else, but nobody ever does anything else. So, um, can you provide me any insight on that reluctance? I can, and that's only because I've faced that same reluctance myself. For the pamphlet that I prepared for one of the courses that I had taken, I wanted to do the paper because I was afraid that if I did something else, there was going to be some deficit there that didn't accurately reflect my work. So I went to the professor's office, and he showed me other examples of creative works that students had done. And that really boosted my confidence because I saw a wide range of options that were available to me. And those concrete examples, which I wish that I had to show you all as well, really allowed me to see the different ways that you could take the material in different directions. So if it was possible that you could include a few example works either on a PowerPoint as a picture or something like that, if you'd like to use the example that I had of the pamphlet, I'll be more than happy to send that to you just to show the students what kind of things that they can do. Yeah. And, uh, and some ongoing guidance because it really is there. You're not sure if yeah. you get the, course, the depth of learning that's required and what that mark is, let's be honest, when you're very confident. And I hate marks. I really do because often we get these arbitrary letter grades or percentages on our tests that show us that we weren't good enough to get 100%, but it, don't tell, it doesn't tell us where we need to improve. Right? So maybe including a rubric for creative pieces would also be helpful because it gives them a you know, guideline of how they would have to do their work. Sorry. No, I, I want to echo that as well. And, and I, uh, I'm also a student and a, uh, a first course instructor in the Faculty of Education. And so I've tried to um, infuse uh, active learning and pedagogies in my teaching. And I put it in my syllabus. This is why I'm doing it. This is the research on it. Um, and inevitably, two or three times throughout the semester, I do a stop, start, continue exercise at the end. It's anonymous. So they say, this is what I want you to stop doing. This is what yep. I want you to start doing and, and continue to do. Um, so that it's not only at the end of the semester when there's nothing I can do about it. Yes. But when I do that, it's interesting that, um, you know, when I do this research-informed practice, they say, please lecture more. We want more lecture. Um, and it's really interesting because I don't think they do, but I think we're just used to that. Yeah. Right? I'm just used to lecture, so why do you lecture? Uh, so I think oh. it's a matter of faculty is getting together too and faculty members saying, Absolutely. let's give them a, the whole experience in our faculty of this is how we want to approach learning, right? And so it's not you as the lone wolf doing yep. active learning strategies. And that's, a, that's an excellent point and something I actually wanted to bring up and I unfortunately forgot is that Something that's really beneficial as well is talking to other people in your department when you're constructing your syllabi and you know, planning out your course dates. Often, a major or a minor requires we take multiple courses in that topic at the same time. If all of your tests are back to back and all your assignment dates are back to back, it creates a lot of stress. So communication within the department is just as important as communications with the students. Right, which is why also allowing that flexibility for some extensions here and there is really helpful. Because if I'm taking, you know, Psych 3241 and Psych 4701 at the same time, and they both want their papers on the same day, oh, great! I only get the assignment outlines a week in advance, so this is going to be great. Lots of caffeine and no sleep for me. Woo! Right? So you know, communication is really key in this. I agree. Thank you. And um, 
communications piece I think is so important. But I agree, I think we get colonized in certain ways to think the paper is the highest form of expression of the final assessment, but also the lecture is the highest form of instruction. The cooperative learning or interactive learning can't be real or good learning. Um, and so I think I notice reticence on the part of students sometimes to say, well, I didn't get a lecture, so I'm not sure I got as much as. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, that's, that's about communication too. My percentage is for I do the alternative assessment too, it's about uh, sometimes half and half, or three quarters do the paper, one quarter do, but I agree, exemplars and so on. Yep. It's also one other thing, the stakes are different when you're, uh, like if you're a visual artist and I say you could draw, you could do a picture, if you're a creative writer, uh, often the paper, because it's been so done, there's less of an, of an investment in doing it for students, so it's easier to do. If you're a creative artist and say, you could draw a picture for me, yep. that's a bit of a scarier thing to do, because you might care about it in a different way. It's so unfamiliar. Yeah, no, I agree. Yes? Exactly. And something else that was brought up with the research that I had mentioned is that often teachers say that they notice children, they act out on the playground after they go out for recess or in the classroom. But nobody's really taken it into account that they're forced to sit still. These five and six year olds are forced to sit still for hours on end. And they're so tired that they can't resist the temptation to giggle or play with that pencil or not pay attention, right? So reevaluating how we teach is really important on all levels. <laughs> um, I just have, so thanks so much for your, for, for your, for your presentation. It was mm -hmm. fun. Well, for me, I was, I was played a little bit. I was not often. Uh, it was fun for me a little bit to play the game of like, oh, I wonder who you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was all, like, it was all good stories. So it's all, you know. Um, but uh, one assignment that I, I tried doing once was kind of a list of alternative sorts of assignments. And it was so successful, the two students who did it, that I now want to do it more often. Because I think part of what's really useful is when students understand what it is that faculty are trying to get them to think through, yep. and that helps in approaching the assignment. And similarly for faculty, it's interesting. So I did an assignment, it was a final project where it was instead of doing a paper, it was design a syllabus on this topic. What would you include? Um, <laughs> what readings would you include? What do you think is essential? Yep. What sorts of assignments do you think would kind of work in this? And I had two students take it up on it. And it was great because it, as they said afterward, like they had never thought about how this sort of thing is constructed, and it actually helped them think through then what they were getting in other sorts of things. Yep. So, and it was, uh, and I got amazing stuff. And I obviously I met with each of the students like a couple of times as they were designing it to make sure they were on the right track, kind of give them a sense of what I was looking for. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to throw that out there as yep. like a thing that. I had heard something very similar when I was speaking to, I'll give you a name, Dr. Lapp, and he was saying that he had students design a lecture outline as their exam question. He gave it to them in, ad in advance, but he said, pick your favorite topic in this course, and if you had to teach it, how would you teach one lecture on this topic next year? And he got amazing responses. But I think I am out of time, so I'll have to say thank you all for coming. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you asked because I spoke to people in biochemistry and I had like 
religious studies and psychology, and I had a wide range of people I spoke to. And with the biochemistry, one of the challenges that he said he found was getting students to display their knowledge in other ways. So he developed a way where they could make computer models of molecules and stuff like that. You know, one of their, their tests was, you know, construct this molecule and tell me what it can be lit, found in and, and stuff like that. But I can certainly chat with you and we can discuss that more. Because I mentioned something like, you know, like models and all this kind of stuff. Hmm. Yeah. 